Hello my friends and welcome back. Happy Friday to you. After this video is done for me, the work week is over and I'm gonna allow myself a little alcohol-free beer. I hope you do also. But in Ukraine, or in Russia actually, Kursk Oblast, things are crazy. Ukrainians have fully entered that oblast on Russian soil and it is the biggest foreign invasion fighting force on Russian soil ever since World War II. Because before, when Russian volunteer corps of the armed forces of Ukraine made their incursions into Russia, we were talking about one to two battalions at most and the incursion usually lasted for maximum a week. According to different Russian sources, we can talk up to eight Ukrainian brigades, which is well over 10,000 Ukrainian fighters on Russian soil. Now in this video we'll go through every bit of information, every last footage that has come out of Kursk Oblast in the last two days, so ever since my last video on it. Let's begin with analyzing Ukrainian tactics. Now what is different between this incursion into Kursk and 2023 counteroffensive? Well, everything. First of all, the OPSEC. 2023 was screamed all over the internet, it was hyped up and then Russians built up huge defensive fortifications, which proved to be quite effective, nullifying the Ukrainian counteroffensive. Well, in this case, we don't even know which Ukrainian brigades and how many brigades are in Russia. We don't know anything. We only know what the Russians on the ground have filmed and reported and written. This is all we know because Ukrainians are very silent. Let's take a look at Ukrainian tactics. Ukrainian forces are not rushing ahead. They are moving slow and with a plan. They bypass heavy Russian units and engage them from the rear or offer a surrender after droning them. They are bringing in brigade after brigade to expand the battlefront without outrunning supplies and fire support. And yes, we do know from Russian sources that Ukrainians have an insane amount of drones up in the air and a very strong artillery support in the back. This is a combined arms effort into Russian soil. It is not an incursion. This is an invasion or a liberation, depending on where you look at it. Because in 1917 and prior, Kursk area and Belgorod area was officially Ukrainian land. So is it a re-liberation? Liberation of the Ukrainian people? Ukraine has seized more territory in less than 48 hours than in the entire counteroffensive in the summer of 2023. According to the author of the publication, the Ukrainian offensive in the Kursk region has three key objectives. The withdrawal of Russian troops from the Donetsk region. Of course, that is not going to happen. Russians are advancing in Donetsk very slowly, very, with very high losses, but they are advancing and it is a huge issue for the Ukrainians. So this surprise attack in the Kursk takes the world attention away from Donetsk, takes the Russian attention away from Donetsk and actually forces Russians to deploy huge amount of reserves into Kursk area. Because if they don't, well, Ukrainians are just going to liberate more villages. Sowing discord in the Russian Federation. That is definitely working. We have these videos of Russian people being very surprised of how human the Ukrainian soldiers are. They're not even torturing. They're not even looting. What are these guys? Promotion of the agreement on the exchange of territories during the upcoming negotiations. Now, this is definitely very important. Things are slowly moving to the phase where there will be negotiations between Ukraine and Russia. And then you need bargaining chips. Kursk is one of them. Also, the Kursk nuclear power plant. We'll get to it. Russian military blogger Romanov claims that the armed forces of Ukraine have 25,000 up to 30,000 troops on Russian territory. Now, these are very brave claims. I would go ahead and claim 10 to 15 K, so half of that, but 30 K, this is a very potent force. And since we know now by the Russian videos, we know two brigades who are in it, 82nd Brigade, an 80 brigade of Ukraine armed forces, which are both air assault brigades, very well mechanized with Western equipment, and they're kind of an elite brigade. So this is an elite fighting force with Western tech, 
with combined arms warfare up in the air with drone jammers. This is a full invasion force. Now here is the list of the brigades that we estimate to be in Russia. We don't know, nothing is confirmed by the Ukrainians. Well, Ukrainians are totally silent actually, which they should be because that, that was the mistake they made before the 2023 counteroffensive. Here is the list. 82nd Air Assault, Elite Brigade. 80 Air Assault, Elite Brigade. 22nd Mechanized Infantry, also an Elite Brigade. Very well equipped. Artillery Brigade, 103rd, 88th Mechanized, Georgia Legion and Special Forces. But as we can see, almost half of the brigades are mechanized. So this is not an infantry incursion like Russians did north of Kharkiv region where fully infantry assaults. This is mechanized with drones up in the air and artillery in the back. I, I'm like a broken record, but I cannot stress enough of how big and well prepared this incursion is. Talking about the preparement of this incursion, it lasted up to two months. Here is a Russian description of what was going on and how the hell were the Russian authorities surprised by this if the Russian troops in the trenches opposite of the preparing Ukrainian forces knew about it and screamed about it? I'll read you the report and this soldier is quite angry. Kursk direction. Who will answer? We rarely allow ourselves emotional posts when the issue concerns military operations. Still, while people are working on the front line, it is a thankless task to act in a single camp with the all killers. However, the enemy accumulated forces for two months. For two months, all the information was sent to useless higher headquarters. There was enough time to make appropriate decisions. In the Kursk region, the lessons from the Belgorod sad and tragic experience were not taken into account. So the previous Belgorod incursions by the Russian Volunteer Corps, the experience from that was completely ignored because it happened again in Kursk. The price of this is the forces of Ukrainian formations that entered Sucha in the Koreanova, the very ones whom the Russian bloc sphere laughed and said that Zelensky was preparing for surrender. So this guy is very salty because the Russian propaganda is something much different than the reality on the ground, which is that Zelensky is not preparing for surrender. He's preparing to invade Russia. Although Russian high command completely ignored the reports about Ukrainian armed forces preparing for two months, up to eight brigades, I mean, this kind of fighting force you cannot ignore. It's just, you, you see them all over the place. But they did. They managed to fully ignore it. And secondly, this area was not, not defended. It was defended. The, Defensive lines were actually built out by the Russians in the last two and a half years, and they were super expensive. While Russians ask what happened to the 15 billion rubles spent during the two and a half years of building two lines of defenses in the Kursk region, Ukraine expands its area of control relatively unchallenged. You see these blue lines, dotted lines right here. That's, that's Ukrainian territory, that's Russia. And these are the newly built out defensive lines that are so expensive, very, very expensive. And they were manned also. But I mean, I mean it's Russia, it's super corrupt. So this money came down from Putin or whoever. Everybody took 10% and by the time it reached those lines, the procurement officers or the officers who superseded the building also took 10%. And finally, a few ditches were dug and now the Ukrainian troops just overran it. I mean, we're going to go into the videos, but there are dozens of Russian soldiers just surrendering. We have videos of it from these very same defensive lines. So completely useless lines very expensive and very useless. Ukraine advanced deeper into Russia. Well, the deepest units, the reconnaissance groups who are ahead of the main fighting force are about 40 kilometers in, in Russia right now. In one day, than Russia in Donbass in the past two years, 32 kilometers. So <laughs> yeah, that is it's a crazy fact right here. Also an interesting situation because now that there's up to eight brigades in Russia, both sides are taking a lot of losses. Of course, Ukrainians are also taking losses and we'll talk about it later. But Russians are also. 
And Russians are promised a lot of money by the Ministry of Defense. We're talking about $65,000 worth of money when they die in Ukraine in the special military operation. Kursk Oblast and Belgorod Oblast are not in the special military operation. So if these guys are deployed in the Kursk trenches and they were like, oh, luckily we're not sent to Ukraine, we're in Kursk, we're in Russia. Now suddenly there's eight elite brigades fighting against you and you die, your family gets nothing. Nothing. Nothing is sent to the families um, because they did not die in the special military operation zone. They just died in Russia somehow. <laughs> it is a crazy situation. How are the local Russians, the civilians reacting to all of it? Well, mostly it's panic because four days later they see that the Russian government and the Ministry of Defense are totally clueless of what to do. There is no force yet sent to fight the Ukrainians back. There is no force present. Everything that the Russians have is in Donbass or in southern Ukraine. There's nothing there. Only now they're mustering some forces. They're calling the Wagnerites from Africa. It will take some time. Locals see it. They see that the Russian Ministry of Defense has no strong presence in the areas. So it's full panic. Full panic time. I mean, on the TV, the Russian propaganda says that we're strong and there's nobody who can defeat us. And then they look outside of the window and it's Ukrainian troops everywhere. Speaking Ukrainian, waving their flags. So panic. Your world just came crashing down. As you can see in this video, gas stations have huge lines. There's gas shortages. People are evacuating, leaving their homes, leaving the areas because they have been disillusioned about the Russian state as an entity. It's just the lies come crashing down as soon as the first Ukrainian tank enters your field of vision. Now, my friends, let me introduce you to the forces that were actually stationed in Russia, in the trenches and in the border areas to exactly keep uh, this from happening, for, to keep Ukrainian troops in Ukraine. These are the forces right here. You can see them. They're doing some aerobics, lifting up their arms. I'm just kidding you. They're all laying down now doing some push-ups. Oh, these are not push-ups. Wait a minute. They're surrendering. Up to 40, 50 Russian troops surrendering to what? Six Ukrainian soldiers. <laughs> oh my God. This made my day when I saw it. It's so good. Six Ukrainian soldiers taken 50 Russian prisoners of war. How is this possible? How? Like, I, it doesn't fit in my head. What? Well, as we can see, they're treated very humanely. The, they're just put on the Ural truck, Kamas truck, and uh, driven back to Ukraine. I heard that the Ukrainians now have an issue because there's so many prisoners of war processing them and moving them and guarding them. It takes quite a lot of resource, like human time resources. Not money, but uh, like professional soldiers have to keep their attention on these prisoners, which means they cannot fight. So it's really a problem for Ukrainians in Russia right now, because Russians, they do like to surrender. Here we can see another exercise uh, taken together by uh, Russian forces and Ukrainian forces. In this physical exercise, we can see them walking. They practice this walking to get their cardio in shape and they're working towards Ukraine. And when you walk like that, so your arms up, it's better for your cardio and body. So that's what they do <laughs> by the dozens. Uh, these guys are just laying down, doing some stretching right here. And later they will walk towards Ukraine. My humor is super dry. I hope you're going to understand it. If you didn't, then these were prisoners of war from another angle and they were being treated very humanly and being transported to Ukraine. This just then, today, this is today. So when you see it, this is fresh. Russia mustered a quick response force since they have no forces to send here. They must scrape together like territorial defense and anybody they can get. And they have gotten some. Let's see. Some Call of Duty visuals here. Very cool. Kurskaya Oblast. We zoom in and boom. What we see, Russians have mustered a quick response force as a huge, massive convoy of hell like it was near the Kiev. Let's see, Toyota Land Cruiser, very sexy car, a lot of Russians, Toyota Land Cruiser, what is this, Ford, 
Of course, in Russia, so far we see a Japanese car and an American car <laughs> mustered by the Russian Quick Response Force. Then we see, uh, what is that? Uh, I don't know what that is. Nissan. Then we see a Kamas truck and artillery. More Kamas trucks. And what I really want to show you is this. Let's enjoy the visuals of the Russian fighting force. Loaf truck. Another loaf truck. Pukanka. Loaf truck. Loaf truck. Loaf. That's what they call it. Loaf truck. Russia restarted the production of these vehicles. If you look at this truck, what would you say? What is the... Um, how old it is? Well, what would you say if I say to you that this truck is five days old? It is produced brand new looking like that. Right now in Russia, they restarted because that's all they can produce. Since it doesn't have any chips in it. It doesn't have any high tech in it. It's fully mechanical. And it's cheap. Loaf trucks. More loaf trucks. Even more loaf trucks. An endless row of Pukanka loaf trucks. This is a fighting force that Ukrainians have not foreseen. I've never seen loaf trucks upon loaf trucks. Oh my god. Well, I hope they're FPV proof. I hope they have insurance. This video is taken on the field in the no man's land exactly between Russia and Ukrainian border. And as we can see, Ukrainian soldier casually films his countrymen's tanks with a triangle. Triangle is when you go to Kursk, that's the triangle thing on Ukrainians. And APCs and everything entering Russia. No problem here. Just go. Nobody's defending that land anyway. Putin doesn't care about the people living next to the borders. So yeah, they're just casually driving across the fields. And it's like, Slava Ukraini, we're going to take back our lands which were occupied by Russians for 100 years. And now, my friends, you have seen some information, some videos, footages, photos. I want to now give you an overview, a summary of what we know, what has been happening, what's the projection. So this is why I pulled you one of the best threads I've found about the Guru Skoblast. I read all of them and I chose this one. So after this video, you know everything there is to know about the Kursk incursion up to today, 9th of August. Now that we have a couple of days to observe the new Ukrainian cross-border attacking to Kursk, I wanted to offer a quick assessment of what we know, as well as Ukraine's potential objectives and challenges it faces. Challenges, yes, because it's not all rosy. I mean, some people and some threads analyze how this was a super bad idea because Russians are actually advancing in Donbass. But let's read it. It appears yet again that Ukrainians have surprised, Ru surprised Russia and observers in the West with their latest operation. Over the past 72 hours, we have watched as Ukraine has launched a significant cross-border assault into Russia's Kursk region. Initially viewed as another raid into Russia, similar to the previous Ukrainian operation in May 2023 and on March 2024, it has become clear that this is something different. Despite our ability to only see a small part of what is occurring in Kursk, there are several aspects of the new Ukrainian operation which are apparent. First, this is a multi-brigade operation. At least two Ukrainian brigades have been identified so far. So there's more, but two have been identified. 22nd mechanized and the 82nd air assault. There are both quality formations. It appears unlike in the 2023 southern counteroffensive, where fresh brigades were employed, the Ukrainians have allocated experienced formations to this attack. Yeah, these two brigades are one of the most best fighting force Ukraine has. Second, the Ukrainians have attacked with highly mobile mechanized force. This is different to the uh, Russian dismounted attacks into Kharkiv in the recent months. A high level of mobility is essential to creating or exploiting gaps in enemy defenses and rapidly exploiting such gaps. Speed and shock action are vital. Third, the Ukrainians appear to have deployed a significant amount of air defense capability. 
at least one Russian fighter aircraft and two helicopters have been claimed to have been shot down by the Ukrainians. Yes, I didn't even talk about this at all, but Ukrainians concentrated three different abilities not connected directly to ground forces, which is anti-air defenses, not anti-drone, but anti-air. They're shooting down Russian air assets. Secondly, anti-drone defenses. We're talking about a huge concentration of drone jammers in a very small area, which completely forces Russian drones out of the sky. Number three, Ukrainian own FPVs in huge concentration. What is going on? The tactics are crazy. Listen to this. What they do is they re deploy and activate every drone jammer they have in the area, concentrating them and fully blocking Russian FPVs. Then they know the exact moment when they're going to switch them off, clearing the sky so their own FPVs can fly. But Russians don't know that moment. I mean, they could fly at that point, but they don't know. The skies are clear now. Maybe they get one or two drones up in the air, but Ukrainians are now flying towards them with hundreds because the sky is now clear, not jammed, and boom, a swarm of Ukrainian drones goes. Boom, 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 they clear the area. They again jam the entire airspace and then send the ground forces to the areas that the drones just destroyed with pinpoint accuracy. And this is how they advance 10 clicks per day in this area. It's a very good tactic. There has been, as of this point, limited reports of Russia being able to use glide bombs or even large numbers of drones to counter Ukrainian assaults. They have not been able to use them. This is indicative of a more effective air defense environment for the Ukrainians than was created for 2023 counteroffensives. Fourth, Ukraine has penetrated a good distance into Russia on at least two axes of advance. Main and supporting efforts are unclear. However, the situation remains very unclear and Ukrainian forces could be much deeper into Russia than we know. This constitutes the biggest advance by any side in the war since late 2022. Fifth, Ukraine has achieved surprise. This is an important theme, not given the obsession of some with describing this war as a transparent battlefield. This again shows that the battlefield is far from transparent and the deception activities, good intelligence and surprise are crucial elements of modern war. I'm not going to read you the rest of it. It is a great analysis and I can just sum it up right now that this incursion as of now the fourth day has been incredibly successful. There are Ukrainian losses but compared to what Russians have lost uh, like physically, the soldiers that have been captured, the techniques that have been destroyed and the loss of image in the world stage, it has been devastating. Now, of course, things can change if Russia actually musters to send 10 to 15 K troops there, which they usually do with these incursions. But as of now, on the fourth day, it's looking pretty rosy for the Ukrainians. And just to get a little bit of laugh, I mean, you can watch this video yourself, but in, this is the first day of the incursion when Putin is uh, gathering the emergency meeting. And Gerasimov is like, don't worry about it. They, we pushed the Ukrainians back. They are <laughs> back in Ukraine. They have been stopped. And now four days later, Ukrainians are on 400 square kilometers of Russian soil, taking massive amount of prisoners. So. It's a little bit of a, a funny to you here. Many people are asking photo proofs of things I say. Sometimes there are photos, sometimes not. But uh, here is Nova Ivanovka. And this is a Ukrainian fighter. This is Yubimovka. This is a Ukrainian uh, APC. There are photos of Ukrainians liberating. Listen to this. Ten villages. Ten photos like that. Ten villages of the Kursk area. Insane area in three days. Photo proofs everything. Now since Russia doesn't have any QRF ready to deploy and as we can see the Bukhanka convoy that they mustered, I mean I, I wouldn't put my my money on that so they're actually calling Wagnerites back from Africa. Wagnerites are mostly fighting now in Mali and South Sudan but they're calling them from Africa to fight back this Kursk invasion because uh, Katurovites you know, the elite Russian fighters, TikTok soldiers, that's what they are. They were stationed in Sucha. And we have videos of them running from Sucha, just abandoning their posts. So when Kadurovites run, 
you have to deploy the Wagnerites. That's what they're doing. But let's talk about Sucha. I always talk about what is this Sucha? Well, it is the biggest city in the area of the incursion and it is right now reported that half of the settlement is under the armed forces of Ukraine. Perhaps the other half also by the time you watch this video. Why is this important? Well, it is a hub transportation hub, gas hub, it's a hub in any sense of the way. Big railway goes through it, big highway goes through it, and huge gas pipelines go through it. If I say huge, I mean the biggest, like everything goes through it. 50% of the gas exported by Russia to the European Union goes through Suja. And if you think the European Union is not buying gas from Russia, then unfortunately we have... Um, Hungary in the European Union and some other countries who still do that in a minor scale, but still that amounts to uh, tens of millions of USD per day. Not hundreds like it used to be, but tens of millions, which is still very bad. And they get their gas through this Suja city, through this gas terminal. You see, these are all pipelines and they are pumping gas to Europe. Now, what did Ukrainian forces do? They blew it up. They blew up the gas pipelines. <laughs> well, Hungary, for example, Viktor Orban, you know, Putin's ally in Europe, has had two and a half years to disconnect themselves with the, from the Russian gas. They have not done it. Now Ukraine has done it for them. Literally, physically for them. They just destroyed the gas pipeline, so Hungary cannot get gas from Russia anymore. That also could have been one of the goals, but also... 30 kilometers or 30 miles actually from Sucha is Kursk nuclear power plant. If Ukrainians liberate that power plant, they have a huge bargaining chip if it would be needed in the future. Now, I will end this topic, uh, but I will summarize. And one topic I haven't talked about in Kursk is the Ukrainian losses. We, there are definitely losses. Any attacking force always has losses. But we have confirmed losses quite small. But I want to give them to you. The Ukrainians have losses, obviously. And because Ukraine maintains communication blackout, we will see only Ukrainian losses and not the Russian losses. So, at least one martyr, Germany uh, infantry fighting vehicle, one American Bradley, multiple BMPs, and at least two book anti-air systems and logistical equipment were lost by the Ukrainians. Now, the biggest losses here are the two book systems. Air defense is always very precious, and when you lose it, it's always very painful. So, this is two, losing two in one day, is, it's pretty bad for the Ukrainians. But compared to what the Russians have lost, it's not comparable. Ten villages have been liberated. About 300 prisoners of war have been taken. Pieces of equipment captured, and I saw the list, it's about 10 pieces, most of them, five of them were Ural trucks, just, just logistic trucks. Airplanes and helicopters shot down, and incursion about 30 kilometers into Russian soil. Now with that, I will end the Kursk topic, and now you know almost every bit of information. I mean, you know as much as I know, and I went through everything that I found online. So if there's anything new in the next five, six hours when you see it, it's because it just hasn't been posted yet since this happens so fast. Uh, now by the time you watch this video, it might be outdated already, but that's as good as I can get to. Now let's jump to my home country, Estonia, for a moment, because there is a change. Estonia and Russia, right? We have a long border together. Russians who live in Estonia have families in Russia and they travel back and forth all the time. Latvia and Lithuania did that a little bit before us and Finland also. They like closed the border. Now Estonia is also doing this. Estonia has introduced a full customs control at the border with Russia. From today, every person, vehicle and luggage as well as cargo will be inspected at the checkpoint. Previously, such inspection was selective. The tightening of customs control was explained by the fight against the importance of sanctioned goods to Russia. So now the Iron Curtain is forming beneath our eyes, on our eyes, in, in 30, 40 years when, it, when they talk about the reformation of the Iron Curtain, then this is how it happens. Finland closed the border, Latvia closed the border, Lithuania, Poland, now Estonia, Boom, we have the new Iron Curtain. And now, my friends, I'll bring to you the butchering of Buy Me A Coffee monthly members. If you do like what I do, if you want these videos every Monday, every Wednesday and Friday, 
Become a member, monthly member, link is in the description below. Let the butchering begin. Someone, Jackson Legge, Mai Elvod, Leo Laattala, Herbsveat, Richard Stratton, At Husky 1984, David Kantara. Thank you to these people. You are elevating me. You are helping me do what I do. Thank you. Until my next video, which will be on Monday. Slava Ukraine and bye-bye.